this place at the north end of what we call the middle cobble uh, of Quarry Hill in Pownall. The whole ridge is a hot spot for plants. Uh, it is a place people came to in the last closing years of the 19th century. A few botanists came here, Willard, Webster, Eggleston first. They brought their friends, they brought the botanical club. They just kept finding stuff here that they didn't find in another place. So it is limey. We're sitting on a marble hill. We're sitting on a marble hill at low elevations in the oak zone. In the place where we're in, you know, I'm seeing big trees. I'm seeing very little signs of recent cutting, disturbance, fire, but there could have been all of those things in the 19th century. Their interest was particularly almost always focused in rarities. And, you know, certainly when the Nature Conservancy acquired this and when we started revisiting it and writing about it in the, I first wrote about this, notes on this in the 1970s and then on after that, the rarities were what caught our eye. There are things here that at that time we may have only known in one place in Vermont. Now we may know them in two or three, or we may, we've added a few things that are only in one place. Rarities are nice, but what draws me back here and to other places years in and on is two things. How many interesting and things sort of with odd preferences. It's, it's not like everything here simply wanted a dry, dry west-facing, southwest-facing limestone hill and they simply all piled here. They have many different preferences, but somehow without necessarily crowding, they all live in fairly small places like time-sharing co-ops. They spread the time out through the season. They do things at different times. That fascinates me. The whole set of underlying mechanisms and geography that make a place special, that make it different from other places. Uh, I've been pointing out to people, and people have been saying, and you know, we have a group today with very experienced naturalists, and everyone has said, well, we don't see anything like this at home. And the reason that people were coming here 120 25 years ago is that they didn't see anything like this at home at all. And you could live on the other side of the valley there in the Taconics. I lived in a hollow in the Taconics in Massachusetts for a year and a half at one point uh, when I was out of college. You would see none of the plants that are here. So my fascination is where they come from, how they get here, how they coexist, to what extent it is something special about the place. To some extent, it is, you know, like, you know, there's like there's a writer's colony in Middlebury and another one in Blue Mountain in the Adirondacks. Uh, those are writer's colonies and those are really interesting, not because the place is particularly special, but because the group of people there has created something special. So I think a lot about the geography of these kinds of places. I think a lot about what I call biostructure. I am sitting on one. This place has a lot of open places with very loose fractured marble, sharp edged. You're careful when you're on it. You protect your hands if you fall in this kind of country. But it has an almost continuous turf that is stabilized by a sedge here, but by really a dozen other players and so. So I think about the geography, the biostructures, the time sharing. The more I think about it, the more I learn and the more I realize that I don't know. So it's, a, it's two things going on simultaneously. It, it has fascinated me for, I first came here in 64, so that's whatever that is. Um, arithmetic is hard outside, but that's, you know, over nearly 60 years or so on. Uh, it still fascinates me. Today is just a teaching excursion with some good people, but 
that's what underlies the kind of things that we will be talking about. Look at it close with your hand lens, like it's got this like... Did you see? Oh, it's yeah. Okay, the, the so-called capitulum. Yeah, it's like got this like little craters in it. And it looks very cool. Like a... They're just about to open, but they're not open yet. You know, the independent cellular amoeboid stage in the life cycle, and then the amoeba come together, and they make a shape. And that's not trivial because then they. Then they assume different roles, you know, somehow some of them decide, oh, we're stalk cells. And, but then they, you know, they not only make a shape, but they differentiate. So these things have a stalk, which is one thing, a covering, which is another thing, spores, which are yet another thing. And then the spores are often within a, a meshwork of fine threads, the capitulum. Uh, so there are at least five cell types involved in this that all, you know, I mean, uh, all came from the same, as far as we know, genetically identical little amoeboid cells, so that at some point, you know, not only when they get together, not only is differentiation triggered, I mean, is differentiation triggered, but they decide they have a particular place within a form, and that's their place. And the thing that fascinates me is just the endless capacity for self-organization, which is to say, you know, there is no foreman, there is no surveyor, there is no set of plans, there is no central control room that oversees it all and says, you go here, you go, go there. It is, uh, you know, somehow, a collective process settles into pattern. Uh, you know, so do, the, so do the rings of Jupiter, but it's still I don't understand that so well either, but, but a little better. Perhaps the third yeah. commonest moss here, just like it's, we it's ought to meet it. Even what happens is like, you know, you could say it's like, oh, people get this mixed up sometimes, they think it's an acrocarp because the yes. main stem is creeping along the rock and then those yeah. are branches that are actually sticking up. Hmm. So it, it can be a little tricky. Yeah, the, you know, there's an informal botanical term called a, a dormatophyte. <laughs> not, not dormant, but dormat a fight. You made that up, I know you did. No, nonsense. He would never do that. This place gets dry, dry, dry. And a lot just simply depends in terms of access of water to mosses, what kind of tree, not what kind, but where you happen to be. If there's a tree branch, it's gonna drip a lot on you yeah. if you're within the stem flow. So the, the mosses in these kind of habitats make a living and their living is water. Uh, in t two different ways, they ideally can intercept flows, uh, so canopy flows, stem flows. Lacking that, they need to be within a pool of 100% humidity at nights where they can have nice little needle tips on which the water condenses. So the two ways to get water to a moss are either to be part of a watershed or to, to be close enough to moist ground that you can wring it out of saturated air. Now, once you have fairly big rocks, or once you have sloping ground or open slabs, there's a lot of surface flow. And so the bigger thick mat mosses, the anomadons and things like that, and the tortellas do very well on that. Once you get up above the soil, you know, the area of saturated soil, I, I think of this as a bathtub in which a layer quite near the ground goes to 100% humidity many nights. And then you can have, you know, sort of moss-made fog basically condensing on these things. But once you get up very high, you know, and very high could be even just two feet, all of a sudden things become much patchier and they, you go to thin mat plants. And they associate with one another. But I mean, really the the thick mat plants are in one kind of situation and they they really i think need surface water flow and the thin mat plants can work with humidity or nothing 
Is this, you can hand some around. This is a nomenon restratus, or the, what it, whatever isn't, or... isn't the other stuff. It's our, you know, third or fourth commonest moss here, and it grows in many different bits and forms and thicknesses and so on. So you need a way of confirming it. And the way of confirming it, the leaves are short compared to the other anomadons, but they have little needle tips. Okay, let's let's talk niams for a moment. A, you know, a, a large part of moss cover in some wet, cold, limey quarries, old quarries, we've found whole walls of the great big some of the great big giant niams, medium and so on, uh, on in old quarried faces and so on. Um, and we find, you know, we find moderate amounts of them in swamps and so on, but for us they, for us they are a moss that, that occurs in small amounts. You know, so we see them in the midst of other things. We don't see large quantities of them, uh, with the exception of Nyam hornum. So, you know, we, you know, we saw that just covering the lower slopes at where the water was surfacing at Eagle Hill and on the banks with all the seepage. And it does the same thing in woodland brooks all around here. Elsewhere the niams are relatively small plants. So the common feature, niam is of course MN, and do we call it niam or niam or what, whatever you want. The niams have oval leaves they have teeth. When the teeth are well developed, the teeth are paired. You know, one goes up a little and one goes down. That's seen from the side like that. Yeah. That's just at the just at the limit of what the hand lens can see. We have a couple of niams, this one and another one where the teeth are very small. This one has no border. The others all have borders like mm -hmm. a tennis racket. <laughs> so niam stellari <laughs> is a moss that that I see many different places, always close to or on the ground, whether it be on rock or soil. Yeah. Yeah. A tree base is a good place. Well, yeah. and we're in a little depression yeah. here, and on a still night, that's plenty enough for some cool air to cool in the walls of the quarry up there, which are also somewhat moist, to slip downwards to, to pool here. So, you know, so you have to just like when you, thinking of a river in flood, you have to start thinking of the the movements of air at night and the mosses positioning themselves very strategically where the air they want is going to arrive. There's nothing trivial in this game. So I'm going to do vascular plants starting from the woodies and going to the herbs and Sue, you and the, the moss folks can preside over a a moss list for around here. Now those moss people over there, they wouldn't even get excited over it. They, they would, <laughs> you know, that couldn't be, but to tree people this is a very exciting thing and this caused botanists a lot of argument here. When they first found it, they named it for a shrubby oak, uh, the, the dwarf chestnut oak, Quercus prenoides, but it didn't stay dwarf. You know, and it may well have been dwarf when they found it in 1897, which I just looked up was the first specimen collected of it here. But now it's tree size in a number of places up here. Wow. We'll be going by some tree sized ones. So it is chinky pin, also no called way. yellow oak, also called Muhlenberg's oh, oak. Wow. So Quercus Muhlenbergii. The most exciting thing to me is 20 or 30 years back, some of the trees, there was just a small group of trees on the other side of the quarry, but they started bearing acorns heavily. And now I'm seeing seedlings like this in a lot of places within a couple of hundred meters of the original colony. Just reflect on this. So we've looked at, you know, less than a good deal, less than an acre's ground here. and. You know, if that was just simply isolated and had a fence around it and a shopping center or something, 
you know, it wouldn't keep these species here. It has to be part of a system. Yeah. A lot of the diversity is here because it's connected to the whole hill. This area may not have been particularly disturbed, but all down there, all in the quarry, we're in the midst of what was an industrial site. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, um, the quarry now is about 85 years since it was last used. It has quite a number of interesting native vascular plants in it, and interestingly, there are some plants that have become scarce or absent because of the lack of openings in the woods that have taken to living in the quarry, which I've known happen otherwise. Your list is about how many mosses? Sixteen. I'm at about 40 plus vascular plants, three or four aliens. All the aliens are the woody things. They, huh. these, these alien honeysuckle, buckthorn, mm -hmm. um, uh, Russian olive kinds of things, mm -hmm. and are are really, and uh, you, you know, and there's there's also. Oh, I've lost the name, that uh, that thing in the milkweed family, uh, Sinanchium, but they changed its name to something. Uh, that's all around here. You know, so it's the woody things that really get into the native woods. Um, they're very bad in the, in the thickets that were open 40 years ago. They're not so bad just in the woods woods. But the balance between that is that, you know, how many of your mosses there would you expect if you weren't on, if you were on an acid hill and not a limestone hill? Oh, gosh. Half, less than half. Less than half. So you've got a very strong limestone calcium dependence in it. And I think if we go down that list, we'll find that some of them are in the Champlain Hills. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. Champlain Hills is, is, you know, limey, calcareous, but it's calcareous igneous rock, yeah, which yeah. has some significant differences. Yeah. You know, Tortella, much, much less common there. Mm -hmm. Anomodon, simply in seepage cracks, but not out, not growing just on the trails, yeah. and so on. Um, my list is two-thirds calcifile plants, but I also have something that's not going on with the mosses. The mosses are very wide ranging, you know, so they look down from the sky, they say, the spores say to one another, uh, that's a good place for mosses, you know, it doesn't matter that it's 50 yeah. miles from the next good place, let's drop here and we'll find a spot. Yeah. So the va many of the vascular plants are southern species for which either right here or the Champlain Valley is their northern range limits or their northeastern range limits. They're mostly to the south and west of us. So, you know, I have here, just on this knoll, the yellow oak, mm -hmm. the elm-leaved goldenrod, um, if that little dwarf Senecio is here, that's another one. Uh, I'd have to go down. I'd have to go down the list. The Muhlenbergia there is another one, and that's just here. But these are plants that either just get to this place and no farther north, or they come up to a few other places. The Champlain Valley is not filled with places like this, and I, you know, I write about this in the notes. But the critical thing seems to be that to get a place like this, you need Calcium rich, that is calcitic limestone, dolomite doesn't do so well. Mm. And you need it to be hard enough to, that is to be metamorphosed to marble so it can make really steep terrain. If it's soft limestone, it just gets weathered down and scraped. And then you need a steep walled valley that the glaciers have come through and plucked, you know, and left steep slopes and cliffs. And then you need a place dry enough to get to the these open glades. Uh, this was a much more open summit even 40 or 50 years ago, this little knoll. So you need a mixture of things and when you ask, okay, 
how many marble places, we can find marble all over the Champlain Valley, but then marble plus big cliffs indicating steep terrain, plus extreme dryness, you know, not just covered over with nice, wonderful, rich, deciduous woods, which are pretty, but we need open, glady, dry oak woods. And the answer is, you know, three or four, maybe, in places like this, including this in the Champlain Valley. So that when you start overlapping the ecological requirements and then open to the southwards because a lot of the vascular plants here don't go above much above a thousand feet elevation. And then you have to get rid of the glacial till so that the, that the, the limey stuff is close to the surface. And most of the places that I know that are bare and very little glacial till and I include all the flat rocks, the alvars around the, the Great Lakes, and I include the uh, limestone barrens of West Newfoundland in this, were either under the sea uh, in the post-glacial or they were under high, high stage glacial lakes. So Lake Bascombe, which floods the whole Williamstown Valley and down North Adams and Adams and so on, the dam that created that was downstream about five miles that way. Uh, and it flooded to 1,100 feet relative to current sea level. And so this whole hill would have either been flooded or just barely an island. So you need, I think you need something, basically a big pressure hose in the form of the abrupt drainage when, when the ice dam fails of these glacial lakes going out to get rid of all that glacial till. And I mean, glacial till is wonderful, but if you had this covered with till, it would just be another maple forest. It'd be a lovely one, but it wouldn't be a dry, glady oak forest. Two caveats. One, this isn't in books. Number two, it, I might be wrong. <laughs> I'm all, I often am, but somebody's got to be willing to guess, you know.